Here now is Chief Meteorologist Tom Sorrells with Talk to Tom. Sponsored by Greenway Dodge. Coming up on Talk to Tom, we are talking pythons. Pythons, the invasive species responsible for dominating the ecosystem in South Florida. Whether they'll slither further north to Central Florida and how global warming could be playing a role. Hello, everyone. I'm Chief Meteorologist Tom Sorrells. Thank you for tuning in to Talk to Tom. This is the time of the week when I take off the suit and the tie and sit here and talk to you, the viewer at home. We've got a great show coming up. It's going to be really super interesting. Um, you can always get in on the conversation here on Talk to Tom anytime you want by going to clickorlando.com forward slash talk to Tom. Submit your question, just like you would if we were talking. Either we'll get you on video or we'll just answer your questions. First one comes to us from our friend Dexter. Dexter says, Dexter Brewer asks, during daylight savings time, the sun sets about 8 p.m. After daylight savings time, it seems to set around 6 p.m. If we set our clocks back one hour, why does the sun set two hours early? Okay, that's just the way it feels to you, Dex. In the summertime, the sunset is after 8 o'clock. But right now, as we're recording this in November of 2023, sunset is about 5.30. I want to say today that I'm shooting this. I want to say it's 5.33. And so if we switch back to daylight savings time, shut the clock forward, it would be 6.33. It's not a two-hour swing. It's a two-hour swing from the height of summer when the sun was setting late, late, late. Um, the sun keeps setting earlier as winter approaches, right up until the first week of December. And from about December 1st to December 8th, the sun will set in Orlando at about 3, excuse me, 5, I think it's 5.28. I don't think we ever get as early as 527. It sets at 528 for about six days and then ticks up 529, 530, 531. Every two or three days, we add another minute of daylight until summertime. So if we stayed on daylight savings time, we would be um, having the sun set about 630 now. Would not be a two-hour swing. But when you compare it to the height of summer, yes, it's a two-hour swing. But it's not legit a two-hour swing from daylight saving time. Okay, good question though, and I, and I know it drives people crazy. And right now, what we're on, as we're shooting this in November, is that we're on Eastern Standard Time. People, people always write to me, beat on the table and scream, I hate daylight savings time. Actually, most of you like daylight savings time, or at least what it does for you in the evening. But think about this, if we hadn't switched, there will come a time in the winter, in December and January, when the sun would not rise until after eight o'clock, about 8.30. And you have kids in school already in the dark and you don't want that. You don't. As much as you complain about switching back and forth, you're used to it. You are. You like the way it balances out. You do, whether you can admit it or not. You do. Nobody wants those kids out there in the dark. All right, next up, Steve Webb. Steve wants to know what does an EF1 mean when it comes to tornadoes? Okay. It's the Fujita scale. It used to just be the Fujita scale. It's wind speed and damage. Kind of like the, the Saffir Simpson scale for hurricanes. We rank tornadoes on a scale of EF0 to enhance Fujita scale 5. Um, if it's an EF0, the wind speeds are about 65 to, I want to say, 85 or 88, maybe 85 miles per hour. 65 to 85 is it 0, an EF0. Your question's an EF1. I don't know if you had one by your house. Or something, but those wind speeds are about 86, about a buck 10, and they go on up. It's EF enhanced Fujita scale zero, enhanced Fujita scale one, all the way up to EF five, which is enhanced Fujita scale five tornado with wind speeds, wind gusts for at least three seconds of more than 200 miles per hour. So it's a dangerous, nasty, catastrophic tornado. We rank the tornadoes similar to the hurricanes. So there you go. That's what that means. EF one means 86 to about a buck 10. And they do cause a lot of damage. Vivian McElroy wants to know. She says, I work in guest services. So many out-of-state guests would like to know why you do not show Disney or Universal on your maps during the show. I do, actually. Vivian, I, I, here's what I self-plug here. I would encourage you to tell those people that they need to watch Channel 6. That's just me. And download the app, too. Uh, we do the, the uh, attractions forecast. We zoom in tight on Southwest Orange County and Northern Osceola County. We have a, we used to have a camera at SeaWorld where we showed off SeaWorld every day that went away after the tragedy. But we have, you know, we, we do as much as we can to show off what's going on 
what is happening. We show iDrive all the time on our cameras. So we do try to show the attractions, and we do indeed do an attractions forecast. We try to air it at least in one of the shows. We try not to be too repetitive and have it in every show, but we do a day at the parks forecast. We certainly do. Certainly, certainly do. And in most, especially if it's going to rain, we really focus on the attractions, the I-4 corridor, and I drive in the entire area. So I, I, I would take exception to that and say we do. We don't, we don't always show just the temperature currently at Disney, but we show a lot of weather from Disney, from Universal. Indeed, we do. And finally, our friend Andrea wants to know about Central Florida's climate change could it change from subtropical, which is what we are, to tropical due to climate change? Andrew, that's a scary, great question. And in simple terms, yes. Here's the deal. The way we've warmed up in the last few decades, it's not been a 10 degree warm up. And every year we deal with the subtropical climate, which means part of the year we are tropical for six months out of the year, between about June till October, middle of May to October, we're tropical. We have tropical downpours. We have everything that drives our weather is sea breeze driven. And our rain is all sea breeze driven. And we don't get fronts that come through here. We don't get cold fronts coming through. So we are subtropical. But, or we are tropical for that time. But we're subtropical because in October, cold fronts start coming. Shuts down the sea breezes. Our rain slows down. And we leave our mean season or our wet season and get into our wintertime dry season. The way we have this figured with the potential for warm-up in the next 30 years to 40 years, is that sometime in the next two decades, if we don't get it under control, shut down the climate change and the global warming, we'll end up with a climate that is similar to Cancun, Mexico. It won't be the, like we're going to be the Sahara Desert. No, we're not going to end up with temperatures of 110 to 113. But we're going to end up with daily temperatures that instead of having an average high in the summer of about 92, will be more like, 96, 97 will be our average daytime high. 97 degrees, 98 every day. We kind of went through a lot of that this summer in Central Florida. We had our calendars up. We showed the days where we were above normal. We X'd them all out. Everything was red, 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 red for so much of our summer. That will become more prototypical. And so in that regard, we'll end up, instead of being truly subtropical, we'll end up being a tropical climate where we stay close to 90 year-round but we do still have a wet and dry season, we believe. Cancun does that. They still have a change to where they do go through a dry season, but they are truly tropical in that they never really cool down. I was recently in Singapore on vacation, and I was fascinated by how hot it was when I was there. It, obviously, it's closer to the equator, so it's so much hotter or tropical feeling than Orlando. But when people asked me how did it feel, I was like, oh, you know what? It felt like Orlando in August. And so I think that what will happen is that we will lose our subtropical classification, become more tropical, most especially from Orlando all the way down to Miami, and uh, end up being a different classification. Tropical, not subtropical, with a wet and a dry season still. All right, that's going to wrap it up. Thank you for sending in your questions. Anytime you want to get in on the action, feel free to contact us. Go to clickorlando.com forward slash talk to Tom. Submit your questions. We'll try to get to you and try to Maybe get some video of you, too, so you can get in on the TV live looking. All right, stick around. Coming up next, if you like snakes, this is for you. And if you don't like snakes, you still need to hear this, like me. Just how soon pythons could be migrating to your backyard right here in Central Florida. Huge non-native snakes are known for eating up much of the native wildlife in South Florida. Some of them look like they might have their eye on Central Florida. A couple have already been found in Bavard County. Now we're going to be asking how long until more of them slither way up north. And if global warming could be helping them out on their trek. Thanks for staying with us here on Talk to Tom. I'm New Six Chief Meteorologist Tom Sorrells. Today we're talking to a doctorate who knows a lot about this stuff. Please welcome to Talk to Tom, research ecologist Dr. Kristen Hart with the U.S. Geological Survey. Did I get all that right, Dr. Hart? That's your title? Yes. Yes, correct. Research ecologist. That's a yes. great title. I love that. Welcome to Talk to Tom. I'm so glad you're here today. Now, I've got to be honest with you. Anybody that watches me on Talk to Tom knows 
if you've ever heard me talk about this kind of stuff, snakes freak me out. And pythons are at the top of that list. They're like at the top of the food chain. So, so talk to me. If invasive pythons are part of your specialty, um, what kind of work are you doing with them? <laughs> so I lead a large reptile research team. And by default, I, um, because I do work in the Everglades, this issue has become front and center. People refer to these giant pythons, these constrictors, as highly intelligent and highly adaptable. Are they both... Are they just adaptable? Do you agree with any of that? I think they're hardwired. I don't know about their, I don't know about them having intelligence. I think they're hardwired, but they're very adaptable. We had a, a paper with some molecular ecologists where we looked at their rate of adaptation, essentially to cold tolerance and things like that, um, that we have here in South Florida and, uh, things like their ability to regenerate their organs. And they do have that skill. Um, wow. those, those those parts of their genome are evolving quicker. So cold tolerance is something. So when you ask me, can they come further north? Probably because they seem highly adaptable to colder temperatures, um, at least from the molecular side of things. Okay. so And it's quicker than we expected. So, so that's, within that's a couple not what I want to hear, doctor. <laughs> I know. As a meteorologist, it's probably not at all what you that's want to hear. not what um, I want to hear. They scare me to pieces. They really do. Okay, yeah. let's talk about in Bavard County. That's uh, we can talk about things going on in Broward and Dade and the Everglades. We're like, oh wow, that's really super interesting. But when they suddenly appear in Bavard County, that's mm -hmm. us. That's here. That's now. We've only tr uh, captured two of them. Is that right? Yeah, I believe it's two. But a colleague of mine has tested certain um, aquatic areas for presence uh -huh. of eDNA, which is like any animal after a bath. Imagine being in a bathtub, and then someone says, "Was there a human in here?" Mm -hmm. You can test it for skin cells. Yes, um, she's done that in places um, near Kissimmee and things like that to say, "Yeah, there's there's actual evidence, you know, of of the Python DNA being in these places." So that's eDNA is one way. Yeah, yeah. near. I mean, Yep. So it's, we're, we're getting detections throughout the range that are in Northern areas. Um, oh, you know, definitely not just down here. And I mean, if you think about an expanding population, I, I may tell you some things you don't know, but they do have the ability to cohabitate and go for tortoise burrows with the tortoise. So if you think about all the gopher tortoise burrows throughout the state, that gives them a nice warm refuge and that might allow them to make it through some colder temperatures. They do climb trees and they do go underground. So, and they're good swimmers. So there's a lot of ways they can make it if the environment is is hospitable for them. And yeah. if we don't have these big deep freezes, you know, uh, that's possible. great. You're you're just Miss, Miss Sunshine today. I gotta be honest with you. I know. <laughs> well, well I mean, I I've, I've talked about their abilities before, mm -hmm. and it is. I mean, it's really they lose some of the females lose half their body weight when they have eggs and then they regain that and they're in very good body condition. I mean, if you, wow. we had the cold snap in 2010 mm -hmm. in a time when, you know, maybe some animals were not in great body condition. Um, and we documented deaths and everything, but the karst features of the Everglades, there's a lot of like Swiss cheese, like, um, rock formation. So they have places to hide. And if you're a little one, you can probably get under some leaf litter and be warm enough to withstand a day or two of cold temperatures. Um, they wow. do seem to make it through some, I would call, you know, harsh weather. We, we did a study where we transplanted them to um, the Savannah River Ecology Lab and all of them died through a winter up there. So In that, Savannah. So yeah. we're not going to go to Savannah yet. Yes. As long as you have winters, as long as you have cold winters. winters. All right, but let's talk about that. That's, that's the next topic up. I was going to uh, bridge this to global warming and the climate change that we've all been experiencing. Um, with a warming climate, which is the change, I call it mm -hmm. climate weirdness a lot or global weirdness a lot yeah. because it's not only right. heat. It's a bunch of rain. Right. It's a bunch of bigger storms. It's, it's everything that's in motion now. With things warming the way they have, obviously these pythons are surviving more and more. You've already said they're slithering up into maybe Osceola and Brevard County, not Orange County yet, but close. Do you expect that they'll keep coming, obviously? And if they do keep coming, do other animals come with them? What else? Well, they are, they are a top predator. So, I mean, they have things like ticks sometimes on them from South America. I mean, just they have different things like that. Um, 
but they are they are a top predator, so they can overtake you know the bobcats or seriously um, How do in they our catch case alligators, alligators, things like that. How do they um, catch a bobcat? They just leave real still. The cat walks up on them and they bite them. Well, they're sit and wait predators, so they call they're ambush predators. So they just like pounce like an attack. Um, yeah, I mean, I think they have the ability as things stay warm to make it further north if there's, you know, ample habitat for them. But they do need a prey base. I mean, they're they're going to move around looking for food. But that, you know, as you get closer and closer to human populations, I mean, that puts dogs and cats and things like that, you know, chickens and all those types of things at risk. Um, and Tom, who walks his dog daily, what's the answer? Obviously, you're, you're dealing with it every day. What's the answer? Now you've done the big hunts. Has that helped? Has that slowed them down? What is the answer to this? How do we stop? Well, we're, so you'd think we have all the basic biology on these animals and we don't. We are really trying to get an understanding of their survival rates. Like what's the juvenile? What's the adult survival rate? Things like that. So we can design strategies to really knock them out. Like where do you put your effort when you're trying to make a population decline? Is it in the adult females or is it in you know the largest part of the population with reptiles like this is usually the younger age classes um, there's genetic tools that can be to utilized to make to sway a population all towards males or you know to give it some sort of defect i mean they're we're really thinking outside the box here with how to control them um, the hunts are really um an outreach event, I wouldn't say they bring in the biggest numbers of, of pythons. You know, there's just a consistent effort to remove animals throughout the landscape all year, but it is a big education and outreach event. And so the, the word is out and the ability to participate, you know, is there. Uh, but there's a lot going on um, to try to, you know, I don't know if we're in the eradication game at all. I think we're just in the control phase because they're, again, I've said they've, they've been here for 40 years. So in some places, down here, you know, they're established and the effort to even find them is a lot. They're very, very difficult to find if you just went walking in the Everglades. Um, but as they get closer and closer to human populations, you know, we may see more of these observations closer to communities. That scares me to pieces. Let's talk a little bit about the timeline. Obviously we found two in Bavard County already. There's evidence they could be in Osceola County in the water. What is the timeline before we're dealing with that wall-to-wall -wall problem like you have in the Everglades? Well, I'm hoping the removals of those two, you know, are not just indicating there's 10 where there's one or two. Because um, if if those if they can find each other, this is the breeding season, you know. Mm -hmm. they, by the time they're two, they're mature. And so by so the they time, can make babies. Right. Yeah. And, so this is the sexy season too, so it really depends sort of when what the what the conditions are around the finding, you know, of those individuals. If I'm they sorry. were out and about in a wooded area or something, I mean, they're looking for mates right now. So, so they were out going catting, as we'd say, trying to hook up, trying trolling. To, yes, <laughs> trolling. That's funny. So basically, the timeline is now. It's kind of like the future is here. Just not everyone knows it. It's happening now. Yeah, and I, you know, I think people are on alert. If you think about nobody reporting this before, maybe people weren't looking, but now people are looking because the education has, has happened with the general public. And so maybe we're getting more records, whereas mm -hmm. in the past we weren't, and social media is a big thing, so people can report, you know, I've got one. Um, yeah, it's hard to say, um, but as soon as one finds another one, you know, if they're different sexes, you can, you can get into population and, and expansion. So that is not what I wanted to hear. I appreciate your time. It's a fascinating subject and you were very informative. I, I could go on forever, but we have to wrap it up. I thank you for joining us. That is Dr. Kristen Hart. Thank you so much. I've learned so much thank about, you. about the snakes. I <laughs> really don't want to know, but I thank you for your time. All right. And thank you for watching Talk to Tom. Remember, you can download this podcast from wherever you listen to any of your podcasts or watch anytime on the new six plus app for your smart TV. Just download it today and please keep watching. Peace.